You know, there's nothing like cracking that, that cellophane and pulling that record out. It just smells great. Welcome to Buzz Mayhem Hour. Non-stop hardcore energy. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. Yeah. Unlike any other. With your host, John the Bud, a.k.a. The Bodfather. Man, this stuff rocks. What's up, everybody? This is Kyle Thomas from Exhorter. And you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. Check it out. The views and opinions of the guest do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Bod's Mayhem Radio Network, its staff, affiliates, or sponsors. Parental discretion is advised. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Radio Network. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I am your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. the Bod Father. And as always, I bring you guys and gals awesome interviews. And today, it's an honor and a huge privilege to have Mr. Kyle Thomas, vocalist of X Hoarder. X Hoarder will play their controversial classic debut album, Slaughter in the Vatican, on their upcoming tour that kicks off November 24th at the St. Vitus. And I hope I said that correctly. Bar in, New- in Brooklyn, New York. This demo album helped to kick start the groove metal revolution while staying true to its thrash roots and uh this thing is a banger <laughs> i mean this is really good from you guys I, i've i've liked this for a very very long time so uh to, to have an album man that still stands true to this day what's that mean to you and how does that feel honestly oh shoot shoot well first let me say thank you uh bodfather for having me and the band on this guest for sure um man that album oh lord uh where do i start uh, my poor mother that's all i gotta say because uh i was a child when we wrote most of those songs um uh, there's only one song on there that i wrote as a, an adult which was the tragic period the rest of the songs we started writing those in 85 86 you know um so it goes back a long way and clearly the controversy of it all. I, I, I was raised in the Catholic school system here in uh, the greater New Orleans area. Uh, so was our drummer, Chris Nail. And, um, you know, uh, if you, the, the truth of the matter is, if you want a good education in greater New Orleans, especially at the time, um, you, you needed to go to public school or to a Catholic school. And uh, so, you know, my parents, especially with my mother being raised Catholic, that's where we were. So I, I want to say I was probably 10, 11 years old when I started feeling uh, a disconnect with the church and, and that, you know, there was a lot of hypocrisy and my relationship with God was uh, being interfered with by the hierarchy of the church. And uh, that's really where the inspiration of it all came from. Not to mention, we were young, angry men who just really enjoyed pissing people off so (laughs) there you go you know you've got the original cover of the demo which actually had not just on the tamed down version of the album cover which was the pope being led to the gallows but on the demo it was actually pope john paul ii who today is better known as saint john paul ii hanging from our demo uh from our logo by a noose with women and children crying and praying at his feet with the Vatican burning in the background. How much more controversial can you get than that? Yeah. Like I, I was 17 when that happened. My poor mother. Uh, what else can I say? Were you shocked though, that that demo made a huge impact on the underground scene though? Because I mean, it seems like everybody at the time was trying at the bit to get their hands on this man. Yeah, it was, it was, in, in demand for sure. But from the moment we played our first show, this band was always turning heads and in demand. Uh, it, we, we played one show and then maybe one or two other opening slots. And then after that, we were headlining mm-hmm. all the time here in, in New Orleans. And, you know, they're talking about 1986 and we had 500 kids showing up every time we did an all ages gig. You know, that's, that's a lot. Oh yeah. Uh, a lot of people for, children to be playing in front of i mean there there were two of us that were still under 18 when that was was happening uh or three of us actually three of us were under 18 when the band started and uh there was another one that was 18 another one that was like 21 we were kids you know mm-hmm. uh so i don't know that the 
the, the legend of this band grew immensely. By the time we did our second demo, which was Slaughter in the Vatican, I think we really had kind of uh, anchored ourselves as a force in in the you know the south uh, you know southeast Louisiana and the surrounding areas and the tape trading community because we didn't have the internet back then to yeah. you know to block everything tape trading community ate it up so mm-hmm. uh, you know get rude kind of was like our introduction to everybody hey here we are uh, what are you going to do about it but slaughter in the Vatican was really like okay these guys are kind of for real. Yeah, and those days, man, were special in their own right because, like you said, they didn't have the internet at the time. People actually came out to shows. And when you have, like, especially young kids that are getting, like, five to 600, you know, folks out to a show like that, that is badass in my in my book because that normally doesn't happen. You know what I mean? No, no. No, it's, it's, uh, it's just a sign of the times, too, because mm-hmm. I, I think – I think today there's an oversaturation and um, that people are, you know, kind of short attention span minded. And I think it's tougher to really keep everybody reeled into something these days. So, and there's a lot more options. So back then, you know, you had the, for, for extreme music, you had the New York scene. And you had the West Coast scene, you know, San Francisco and Los Angeles. And that's where the industry focused. Um, so a lot of that's why a lot of bands back in the day used to move to California or, or to New York uh, to 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 have that opportunity to to showcase themselves. And, you know, the, the, the labels got wise and started shopping outside of those markets. Eventually you had the New Orleans scene, the Seattle scene and, you know, uh, you know, down the line, you got bands from Iowa, like Slipknot, you know, cracking it. And th- there's great music everywhere. It's a shame that it got overlooked so much back in the day. But but I, I think because we were so far away from L.A. or um, you know, Chicago or New York that in southeast louisiana and the gulf region you know the only the biggest city to the west of us is houston and the biggest city to the right of us is probably atlanta so mm-hmm. we're, we're kind of the mecca of of the gulf coast uh you know mississippi and alabama and such so so we're the hub of, of everything and, and people used to come in for the shows and, and stay the weekend and go home let me ask you this, since we're still in the pandemic, and we'll, we'll get back to the to the, uh, to the the album for sure, but I just want to ask your opinion on this, though. Do you think that the pandemic has caused an even playing field now with bands where they can put their albums out? I mean, I know that you could do this before this, but does it seem like it's an even playing field for everybody now? Um, I would like to think so. Uh, uh, it's an interesting point that you're bringing up because, for me, I, I, I really – feel for the younger bands that are up and coming and and doing an upstart campaign because the 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 way the industry has evolved with downloading and streaming and such it's really hard to break a band right now from ground zero without a lot of financial help um i i wouldn't i would i tell you if i didn't have a leg you know my handful of legacy bands to lean on like exhorter and trouble you know i, I really don't think I would do much more than just record music for fun because there is so much to lose. And, uh, but, but perhaps you might be onto something that I'll tell you this much. I've, I've played a handful of shows throughout this pandemic time, mostly cover shows locally Mm -hmm. here in New Orleans because I do work in cover bands too. It's good money and it's, you know, it's pretty fun, better than working with hand tools and getting filthy. So, uh, but you know, that just I, the people, when they come out to the shows are so much more appreciative than I remember them being before the pandemic. I think that isolation and that, uh, just everything being locked down, I, I think everybody got a new appreciation for freedoms and, uh, 
and you know creature comforts and such so i i'd like to think that younger bands probably if if they're going to do it now's the time you know hit it while the iron yeah i I agree with that a thousand percent it's like i've talked to many many bands local bands i'm like look get your shit out there now because don't wait around (laughs) because who knows what's going to happen after this i mean it could just explode or it could be faltered i mean you need to get off and do it (laughs) yeah and i can't say enough any bands that didn't take advantage of the downtime during the pandemic by writing, 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 and creating more material. If you waited on that, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, that's probably a mistake because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, we, we couldn't play the shows. Uh, what, what else are you going to do? You know, uh, we, I've got, we've got a new exhorter album in the works. There's been a new trouble album that works forever, but I've also, gotten back to writing stuff for what I'm eventually going to do for a solo album. So I, I did nothing but write and record the whole time. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm set. <laughs> so, so did this kind of like reset you or recharge your batteries, man, uh, to, to do more stuff for the bands that you're involved in? Um, it, it, well, it forces you to slow down some things. Um, you know, you don't have to, worry about building a tour when nobody can tour uh because putting a tour together is really a lot of work man i i I don't recall in my lifetime just with this tour we got coming up now just how much work i've ever put into a tour like this one uh first of all it's it's a proper tour it's a live nation tour with a handful of really good and strong support acts uh you know, proper venues, uh, with a full, uh, a full crew. And and there's just so much that you have to think of the last time I put a a tour together all by myself. And I shouldn't say by myself, because I'm not putting this tour together by myself, but, uh, to be overseeing a tour get put together was in the nineties. Uh, and, and, and it wasn't at this level. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm having some growing pains, getting reacclimated to it a little bit, but it's it's well worth it. This is this is my baby, and this is um, what I've, I've I've set myself up my whole life to be in this position. So I'm surely not going to complain about it. I'm blessed to have another opportunity to do it. That's for sure. Oh yeah, and Ben should realize that that you know when you're getting back out to do these shows again, he thank thank the Lord above because. This could have went really sour, really fast and bad. So you know what I mean. <laughs> and look, next week, who knows? You know, exactly. that, that's my biggest fear right now. Is we're set to launch. Should should something turn for the worse, and then they go up, shut it all down again. Yep. Mm-hmm. We're in deep shit, you know, because we're we're really invested into this tour right now. You know, I, I know bands are always writing, but at that time, Kyle, did the songs come pretty easy writing for Slaughter in the Vatican, or was they? Still at that point, you know, you're still working on stuff. Um, it, it's crazy because the process of writing the Slaughter in the Vatican album didn't happen quickly. It was over a long period of time because, like I said, half or more of those songs were actually on the Get Rude demo. So you're talking about we started writing those songs. Uh, the 1985 was when those some of those songs started getting put together before we had even all met each other and uh and then once we were all together they started falling into place so probably over you know less than a year's time the entire get rude demo was put together which was i don't know what like six six songs maybe Mm -hmm. um and and so all of those songs except for the instrumental intro and uh and ripping flesh all of those songs ended up on the slaughter in the vatican album and then the the slaughter in the vatican demo the newer songs we added were were written shortly thereafter uh so so that was 85 through 87 Mm -hmm. and then the album doesn't come out till 90 so the only other song written after the slaughter in the vatican demo was uh was a tragic period so 
Uh, quickly, I wouldn't say quickly. Now, sometimes during the writing process, they might fall together a little quicker. When you're in a really strong writing mode, I know from me, sometimes it just, I spit it out quickly and I, I can't spit it out fast enough. And I have to be careful that I'm selective because I got so much coming out that I just don't want, I don't want any of it to end up being fluff. You know, you, you want it all to be good content. Right. And, um, and sometimes you have to sleep on it and listen back the next day and say, eh, it makes the cut or no, it doesn't. But uh, no, the, that album got put together over almost five year period. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. It took a while, and you guys sat on these for a long time. And and why did it come out like like you said, what 1990? 90? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that was those songs were all so old. Yeah, except for the tragic period, those songs were almost five years old when the album finally came out. You know, so I I, I think had we been in a different market like L.A. or New York, we probably would have gotten signed talking about 87 and probably had an album out by 88. So, you know, but then again, I was still in high school. I wasn't doing any of that. <laughs> My parents wouldn't have let me. <laughs> so were there any tracks, man, that we could see possibly on a B side or anything that didn't make this album that could see the light of day some someday, possibly down the road or no, were they all on there and done with? No, all of those songs are either, all of those songs are either on um, Slaughter in the Vatican, The Law, and then we ended up putting Ripping Flesh on More in the Southern Skies. So all of those songs are spoken for. The only song that never made it to anything was a song we had called The Poser Song, which was very inspired by Stormtroopers of Death, uh, just kind of a tongue-in-cheek, you know, beat up the posers kind of song. And, and, and it wasn't really as well crafted as the rest of our songs. It wasn't terrible, but um, nothing that we ever felt was strong enough to make it to an album. And it, it's, it's kind of almost like a forgotten relic. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't feel the need ever to see that make it to anything really. We've got so much more good stuff moving forward. <laughs> Looking back on that album though, would you go back and change anything at all? If you had the opportunity to through like remaster, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, I'd start over and record the whole goddamn thing over again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It it, it really, uh, you know, God bless the people who helped us finish it. You know, the the team at Roadrunner at the time, Scott Burns yeah. and Morris Sound Studios, they helped us make what started out wrong uh, sound as good as it possibly could. We uh, we played this. We played the songs too fast for starters. Go listen to the Slaughter in the Vatican demo, and you'll see what I mean. The Slaughter in the Vatican demo was what we wanted to be the album, but the label refused because they felt like it hadn't been recorded properly. So they wanted us to start over again. Well, by that time, most of those songs had been recorded three or four times and we were tired of them and we're ready to move on from them. But, uh, you know, when the people who are paying the bills are pulling the trigger, you, you kind of have to do what they say. And I think we, we lost a little bit of the vibe in the delivery of the songs and uh and really a lot of those tones weren't signature exhorter tones that was actually stuff that you know was more of a scott burns thing that he was dialing in and we just used his formula and it worked and you know so i, I hear people talk about the classic exhorter guitar tones from either slaughter in the vatican or the law and i'm sitting there going y'all have no idea y'all have never seen us live if that's what you think is our signature guitar tone Listen to More in the Southern Skies. That's the proper album for Exhorter Sound, for sure. And having Marzi in here, man, what a phenomenal freaking guitar player. I mean, he just blows it out of the water. I mean, I, I love Marzi's guitars, the way he plays. Uh, that's just me personally. Yeah, Marzi's, uh, Marzi got a little bit of extra special uh, sauce the day that he was created. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's just... That's just that that's the nature actually of of anybody that plays in this band. Usually everybody that plays in this band is somebody who's kind of a cut above at their position, you know, whether it's bass, whether it's bass, drums, guitar, or vocals. It, it, it usually takes come and really I especially in the early days, what I was doing wasn't necessarily virtuoso singing. 
I actually learned how to do that kind of singing later down the line, but uh, especially the musicianship, you know, just, and, you know, the, the, the writing and the crafting, it's very complex and not just anybody can play in this band. It, it's, it's really uh, something that we've prided ourselves on for, uh, for the entire time that we've been together is that not only do the songs groove and touch you and hit you in the feels, but, uh, but they're not easy to play. And uh, that, that's definitely something that we've always been proud of for sure. For you, Kyle, what, what's impressed or excited you the most about making the Slaughter and the Vatican album? If anything, man, what sticks out the most for you personally? I mean, I know that's your, you know, big demo, but what, what, what sticks out for you possibly? I mean, for me, the whole, the whole excitement was that we finally get to do a, a real album that's going to be released worldwide. And, you know, it, it's kind of like when you cook for people, I, you know, that I, I usually eat very little when I'm cooking for people uh, because to me, the satisfaction is other people going, wow, that was really good. And, and me providing that comfort of a full belly for somebody and, and cooking as a craft, you know, it's kind of the same thing with songs. When, when, when you're writing them, they're yours. And then once you release them, they no longer belong to just you. They belong to everyone. So that's important too. You know, you, your pride in, in your final project and look, your final product and it, ask any artist or musician or whatever, whenever you're doing creative arts, it's never finished. You just have to finally put it down and walk away from it and say, this is good enough and leave it there because you'll drive yourself nuts. Oh yeah. Trying to, uh, to make it perfect. Oh, yeah, you be your own worst enemy, man. And somebody else that's never heard it or, or tasted it before come in and be like, this is the best I've ever had. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly. so, so on this album, man, do you have any tracks that stick out for you? I, I know these are your babies, Kyle. I know that and understand that. But, I mean, do you have any that stick out for you that are, that are possibly some of your favorites off of it? Maybe. Um, Each one, that, you know, that could – that's subject to change on a daily basis. Sure. But um, I think – the one that I hold probably the most special to my heart is the song Exhorter because um, of all the Exhorter songs that we ever recorded, um, that, that's the only one where some of my uh, riff writing actually made it to the album. And, uh, and so uh, I, I've, you know, I've, I've written and Re recorded and released many songs and albums over the years that I did write musically but for this band in particular you got a lot of people who are really good at songwriting and everybody's jockeying to get their song in or their parts in so um, you know at the time it, it was a little tough for me being the kid singer you know <laughs> hey guys check this out check this out but you know what I did that for that particular song you know, the chorus of the song is pretty much my creation musically. So uh, definitely something that 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 I, I feel strong connection with. Plus, it's it's really probably the most punk song on the album. And at the time we were playing mostly to the punk rock community. And that's when crossover was really happening. So it was a special time in my life. Um, just always had a connection with that song unlike any other, but, you know, I mean, death in vain, I'm, I'm, I'm an Edgar Allan Poe fan. And, uh, and that song was inspired by his writing. The song, the tragic period is about Edgar Allan Poe. And I mean, desecrator and slaughter in the Vatican, my God, you know, that's, those are masterpiece songs that are staples. We can never not play those songs. The album artwork is insane. And if this album artwork does not grab your attention, if you see it in a store somewhere, then there's something wrong with you. But who created this album art? Because I, I like it. I mean, I like stuff like this. But what, who, who, who did this? Ken Matthew is uh, the guy that did the album cover. I remember at the time we were not happy about it because we wanted to use the demo album cover, but the label would not allow it. Uh, I, I guess they felt like it was just too controversial being that 
John Paul II was the Pope at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we reluctantly agreed to have an alternative uh, design. And uh, I think it's, it's aged well for me. Uh, you know, for, for what I didn't enjoy about it back then today, it's like, it, I mean, it's, you see it and instantly, you know what it is. It's, it's, it's signature. It's, uh, very identifiable. Uh, I think Ken did a great job on it. it it's got that kind of, um, I want to say, you know, is it punk or is it metal kind of artwork, you know, like the, mm -hmm. like the bonded by blood album cover. Or, uh, you know, Fetus of Fetus by uh, Deglo Abortions back in the 80s. You know, you look at these covers and they're kind of cartoonish, but kind of artsy too. Mm -hmm. It's like a and, rebellion in a, in a photo, you know, in pretty much. Yeah, GBH, City Babies Revenge. Look at these album covers. They, there's, a, there's a punk element to it, but, uh, you know, these are all bands that were kind of crossover anyway. So uh, I think that was definitely... Uh, a special thing about that era of music was if you saw an album cover that looked like that, you knew you were in for a ride. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and, and I've had many conversations about that. I've even bought albums, dude, just, just base off the, the album art and bring it home and be like, fuck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Sure. Sometimes, sometimes that backfires on you. And sometimes, you know, yeah. it's a great measuring stick. Sometimes I bought a dangerous toys album just because of the album artwork. I was yeah. Like, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> right. so when x order came back together to play some festivals and venues how, how much motivation did this add to your guys fire to continue man you talk about you know only i don't know not even a dozen shows that we had played in between 1992 and when we decided to put this back together in 2017 so, so when we debuted in 2018, again, uh, or were reintroduced, yeah, you know, that's a long time to go. Our, our last show before that was like, I don't know, 2011. You're talking about seven years of going by with absolutely nothing. And um, I, I don't know, for me, it was uh, now I stayed busy. Not everybody in the band stayed busy during that period of time, but I did, I had, a, you know, I did floodgate. I was an Alabama thunder pussy. I've been in trouble. And then I had other acts that were, you know, kind of more underground that, that I worked with from here, Pitts versus preps and Jones's lounge. I've done so many things, you know, not to mention I stopped for a while to raise my family and blah, blah, blah. But uh, I tried to walk away from music more than once. And it's just something that, calls you back when you're a true musician you you can never walk away from it 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 yeah i wake up i wake up in the middle of the night with musical parts going on in my head and have to get up sometimes and and go you know record it on the phone mic just so i can have it <laughs> for the morning uh so but but yeah to be away for that long and to step back up the the lucky part for this band is i don't know why but every time we disappear for a long period of time we come back and we're bigger than we were before and i think that's testament to the music to yeah. be honest with you because it surely wasn't because so many people had seen us play live and missed us we didn't play a lot of shows we we played a handful here and there over the years we've played we've beaten down the road a lot more in the last four years than we ever did uh the whole time we were together before so uh we're just now really kind of starting to uh, to create that legend outside of our region where we grew up, where, man, you've got to go to an exhorter show. It's, it's not just a concert, it's an experience. And that's, that's what I've always wanted with this band, with the live show, having people walk away and go, that was life changing. Mm -hmm. And especially when you put albums out, not like every year, every year, and especially the breakups you guys had and to still stay, you know, relevant and people still want an exhorter man that that to me is like like you said it, it's it's the music says it for itself i mean that's that's huge because yeah. that normally yeah. doesn't happen you know yes indeed yeah uh not everybody is as fortunate you know sometimes bands disappear and 
and and the interest just wanes and and they want to come back and they don't have the uh the draw or the interest as much as they used to and and so they're you know stuck at a level that they had already been at on their way up you know and and we're lucky we're fortunate and and as long as we keep pushing and continue to 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 put out these you know knockout performances that we pride ourselves on then our ceiling keeps rising and and that's what i want you know i I sure didn't get back into this just to play a couple of shows for my artistic satisfaction and be done with it no no I've, i've got my sights set on greater expectations than that what was a spark to actually do uh slaughter in the vatican in its entirety man on this tour what what was the sports yeah let's just do this well we uh we 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 did the show our first show back was at saint vitus back in early 2018 and it was a two uh two night series where we were doing slaughter in the vatican in its entirety and the law in its entirety and it was so well received then that our management had gotten us booked for the 2020 cycle Las Vegas doing the album in its entirety. And, um, and then that got pushed back to 2021 because of the pandemic. Right. So, so this year, as we were preparing, uh, to, to, to get ourselves ready for rehearsals for the album, uh, you know, we, we just kind of discussed it amongst each other that it might not be a bad idea to see about a tour. And our booking agent uh, over at Continental Touring, Dan Defonce, I, I messaged him and said, man, do you think anyone would have interest in this as a tour? You know, I, I think this might be kind of cool. I know people do that from time to time. He said, well, let me run it up the fucking flagpole and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> comes back a little while later he goes i got a tour for you guys already wow, that quick. Uh, headlining tour and instantly we were like yes indeed so um it's not something that i want to spend the next couple of years riding out but it's something that i know that we can at least pull out from time to time i'd like to take it to europe and go do it over there you know not in the next few months because we've got an album to write and that, that's that's what's happening next. We we're finishing this tour and we're getting back to business with this album. And we're really not going to do too much else until the album's done. But um, yeah, this is something that we can keep in our back pocket and and do down the line. Uh, I, I think this album it's it, it's always slaughter in the Vatican that it comes back to. You know, there's there's a contingency of people that prefer the law, and I'm sure there's people that prefer more in the Southern Skies that aren't too into the old stuff, and vice versa. But at the end of the day, this is our bread and butter. This is our go-to. This is what most people uh, identify this band with is this album. So I think there will always be the option and the opportunity for us to take it out on the road uh, uh, and do tribute and homage to this album. And and I think people are usually going to be interested in it. So we're, we're going to find out in the next few weeks just how much they want to see this. <laughs> Now, I know you guys are writing the uh, album uh, more in the Southern Skies follow up to that album, I should say. What yes. about your, I want to talk about your solo album, man. What's going on with that? How much you got written on it? Are you going to do this after the follow up album to more in the Southern Skies or, or what? Yeah, I don't think it would be fair of me to prioritize my solo album right now because I've got two albums that have been in the works already before I decided to to really get into doing that. I've had the idea to do the solo album for many, many years, but the pandemic really kind of exacerbated me putting it into motion and getting it started. But, you know, I've got a team of guys with Exhorter that we already started writing with, team of guys in trouble, same thing. So for me to put those on the back burner for a solo album, I think would be uh, kind of an insult to these guys and just unfair in general. But it doesn't mean I can't work on it, which is what I've been doing. And uh, so uh, Floodgate ended very unceremoniously. I, I never had a good taste in my mouth with the way things ended for that band back in the day. And the simple fact of the matter is 
I don't know if or when Floodgate will ever do anything again as the original lineup, just because I'm, I'm not sure everybody in that band is in a place right now where they're able to, or even want to do that. Mm. But, but uh, we, we, I mean, we had started writing songs for another album and there were a handful that we never recorded. So all, any, any songs that we demoed for floodgate after the fact, I'm not, I'm not doing anything with, uh, with re-recording or anything, but there were a handful of songs that I had written for that album that uh, one of them made its way onto the Jones's Lounge album that we did, uh, Nest of Broken Hearts. That was supposed to be a Floodgate song. Uh, this on, on this one, I've got two or three that I had started writing with Floodgate and just never finished. So, you know, I have some old stuff that just been sitting on the back burner for many years. And then I had stuff over the last 15 years or so that I started writing. And then I had stuff that was just brand new that came to me like that. And uh, so it, just for everyone's, you know, burning questions, if anyone even cares, if I'm doing a solo album, it's not going to be thrash. Uh, okay. I have my thrash outlet. My thrash outlet is Exhorter. I'd barely listen to thrash at all. So, uh, so for me, thrash is exhorter and pretty much nothing more in my life, uh, unless I just feel angry and I need to put Hell Awaits by Slayer on or, or Dark Angel, Darkness Descends. <laughs> I'm probably not listening to it. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, I guess, maybe where I left off with Floodgate and 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 maybe Jones's Lounge type music. But also, I've got the green light and the license to do kind of whatever I want. So if I want to do acoustic pieces, I can do that. Or if I want to, you know, I've, I've got some remakes of some old uh, songs that meant something to me growing up that, you know, were radio songs that I'm working on and a little bit different than anything I've done at departure for sure. So you might see a little bit of everything on here. Uh, don't come in with too many expectations and you won't be disappointed but if let's just get it out of the way, it will not be thrash. You know, and, and I appreciate you doing it as a musician because I, I like to see musicians grow. Like, okay, I've got X order. That's that's like you said, that's the thrash stuff right there. But this is a Kyle Thomas solo album. This is what I want to do. This is, you know, that's my thrash band. This is what I want to project out there for me. That's cool. I like that, man. I love to see musicians grow like that. And a lot of them are scared to do that. Uh, you know, there. I don't know how musicians can like play a certain genre and only listen to music from that genre. That to me, it's like okay. all you're doing. All you're doing is creating influences from your peers. You're taking influence off your peers and nothing else. To yep. me, by not listening to a lot of that stuff, everything that I listen to is going to influence me in some kind of way. So I'm drawing influence from things that aren't what I do. And that makes, I think, what I do in the thrash material that we write probably a little more unique and proprietary to anything else that I'm doing or anything else that maybe someone else is doing. And you, that's what you want. You want your stuff to sound different. Yeah. You don't want to put some, your, your album on next to somebody else and, and have them not be able to tell which band is which. I, I yeah. think <laughs> that's, that's kind of the lazy way out. Uh, and not to mention around the house, I'm usually listening to the Beatles, Humble Pie, uh, old funk, like 70s funk or 60s funk, like James Brown. Um, I might put on uh, classical music one day. Uh, you know, I, I might I might be listening to Hank Williams Sr. I, you know, oh, there you I, go. I, I like I like a, I, I like good music. I, I am a musician. I've been a musician since I was in third grade. And I grew up listening to so many different things. Uh, you know, I love the uh, the classic 80s new wave, you know, post-punk kind of stuff like The Fix and uh, Roxy Music. And, you know, I love listening to The Stooges, old sh old stuff that became, you know, you know, the, 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 you know the, the prototypes for what became punk, all this stuff. I love old punk. I love listening to uh, The Dead Boys, you know, it's... I, I can't I can't ever listen to one thing for too too long. You ought to see my Pandora. It's like it's like 
it's like somebody backed up uh, a, a warehouse full of all kind of different uh, CDs and vinyl and, and <laughs> cassettes and just exploded into a room. That's what I listen to. Everything. You know, I'm a metal and horror punk guy. I love punk. Absolutely love punk. But I love ska just as much as I do metal and, and punk and stuff like that. Like Hepcat. They're an awesome band. I was talking about this the other night that you can come into my house too like that. And I'm listening to everything. And then Hepcat comes on. It's just like, it's just so peaceful, man. It puts you at ease. You know what I'm saying? It's like a yeah, different yeah. world. It's like, oh, thank God for music. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Do you still have a go-to album or a song that you find yourself going back to and listening to from time to time, Kyle? Do you see anything that you have to gravitate back to to listen to? Um, song, I, I, there's just too many songs in my life for me to feel like um, feel like there's one. Like, I don't have a favorite song. My, that, that's contingent upon my mood, you know. But, uh, you know, I guess that there's two things that I'm always going to go back to. Um, I would say it's got to be Black Sabbath and the Beatles. It's, you know, and and, and not just uh, Ozzy era Black Sabbath. Uh, tonight I'm performing a show. I'm doing a tribute to Black Sabbath, the Dio years with some great guys tonight. And, uh, and so to me, Black Sabbath is like gospel. Yeah. But the Beatles are God. So, <laughs> you know, uh, that's just so much, uh, you know, that I grew up on that, that uh, just tends to be my go to. So uh, I, I remember when my children were small, one morning I put on the Sunday morning and I put on the first Black Sabbath album. And my oldest son was like, What's that, Dad? And I said, You know what this is, son? And I showed him the album. I said, this is church. You're about to go to church. <laughs> and we listened to the first Black Sabbath album. He was like, wow, that was so cool. It was like great bonding moment for me and my son. That's awesome. <laughs> Folks, you want to get out and pick up Slaughter in the Vatican. You want to pick up any, any X order album, especially the current album that's out right now. Uh, More in the Southern Skies. Pick that album up and support X Hoarder. Trust me, you will not be disappointed. Also, their tour kicks off November 24th at the St. Vetus. Vi I know I'm going to screw that up. Vitus. 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 Bar, Vitus yeah. Brooklyn, New York. Get out and check that out also. And uh, give, this, give these guys a fair shot. You won't be disappointed. So, Kyle, my friend, how can folks stay in touch with you guys? Buy some merchandise, all these albums, tour dates, all that good stuff. How can they do that, sir? We're pretty easy to find, uh, www.exorder.com. Uh, so we're, if you go there, you can, there's links to all of our social media. We're on Instagram and Twitter with at Exorder NOLA, like no, New Orleans, Louisiana NOLA. So at Exorder NOLA, we're on Facebook. Um, we've got a YouTube channel. We hadn't done a lot with that lately, but we're still there. I, I'm, I'd like to try to start kicking that thing up again. But uh, we're 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 kind of like uh, a bad case of an STD or something. We're, we're <laughs> we, we might go away for a while, but we're always coming back. <laughs> and I'll have all the links posted down below in the uh, when we post this for the interview and everything. All, all the links will be in here for everybody to go pick up all this stuff. So, Kyle, before I let you go, good sir, would you care to do a promo for my show? I would be happy to. What's up, everybody? This is Kyle Thomas from Exhorter. And you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. Check it out. Everybody stick around. we got some great, great stuff coming up. And you only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour. Please get out and check out our Facebook page. It has our podcast link and our YouTube link. And please, folks, subscribe to the YouTube link. And if I get a lot of subscribers, I'll eat a bologna sandwich and sing Baby Shark. Or I'm a Barbie girl without my shirt on or something other just to get some more subs. I don't know. I'm crazy like that sometimes. But anyway, get out and check out Exhorter. Check out their tour. You will not be disappointed. Kyle, my friend, thank you for your guys' music, and I uh, appreciate everything that you guys do. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to help us get the word out. Thank you so much. You're listening to Bud's Mayhem Hour. Hour.
follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Hey everybody, it's John the Bod, a.k.a. The Bod Father, a Bod's Mayhem Hour. If you want a great podcast to check out about Ozzy Osbourne, then look no further than Diary of the Mad Men, the ultimate Ozzy podcast with hosts Dan Drago and Josh Crum. Jump aboard the crazy train with two lifelong Ozzy fans who will bring you two unique perspectives on his legendary career. Diary of the Mad Men, the ultimate Ozzy podcast, discuss all things Ozzy and all things Ozzy related, such as all albums from all of the eras, tours, Ozfest, reunions, and more. They'll pit albums against each other in battles to determine the ultimate Ozzy albums, plus discuss Ozzy-related artists, such as Randy Rhodes, The Mighty Zach Wild, Jakey e. Lee, Bob Daisley, and Black Sabbath, among others. Please check out Diary of the Mad Men, the ultimate Aussie podcast, where podcasts are available. And trust me, these two guys, they know more about Ozzy Osbourne than I think Sharon or Ozzy knows about Ozzy himself. So be sure to check out Diary of the Mad Men, the ultimate Aussie podcast. Jump aboard. <laughs> 